Hello, welcome back to My Hot Kitchen. I'm Wendy, and we're back with another awesome date night feast to knock your sweetie's socks off on your next date night at home. We're gonna have a little tri-tip steak topped with scallop butter. It's a nice little twist on the old surf and turf combo. Scallop potatoes with fennel bechamel, savory acorn squash, and for dessert, cookies and cream panna cotta. So let's get started on those steaks first. I'm gonna come over here and you're gonna hit them with a little bit of chili powder. I have a half teaspoon all in all and I'm gonna sprinkle some on each side. And then I'm gonna stab them and make sure there's plenty of holes in the meat for the marinade to sink in all the way through it. We're gonna take a little red wine, about an ounce's worth, a little Worcestershire sauce, about a teaspoon worth, and a little red wine vinegar, about a half ounce worth and a little squeeze of lime. Now, good marinade should have several elements to it. There should be a nice acidic melt element to sort of break down and tenderize the meat. You want some spices in there. Anything from simple black pepper to, oh, chili powder or very complex and rare spices, coriander, anise. Those are all very nice on steaks. And you need something kind of briny and meaty. That's what I'm using, the Worcestershire sauce. And then the wine just kind of rounds it all out, brings it all together. Now I'm using a tri-tip steak for this recipe because I really like the flavor and it's just kind of a fun shape cut. It's a cut off the sirloin and it's known for being very tender and fairly economical to buy. It's one of those items that when it's on sale, I totally go for it because it is almost as good as a ribeye. And if it's marinated and cooked properly, it's very tender and delicious as well. So I'm just gonna give my hands a quick little wash here. Because one should always wash their hands after handling raw meat. And I'm gonna stash it in the fridge until I'm ready to grill it. And now I'm gonna move on to dessert. So I grab one cup of milk out of here. And I'm gonna use that in a few moments to make the custard for the panna cotta. But before I really get started on that, I'm gonna make the cookies for the cookies and cream panna cotta. Now this is a dessert recipe that any cook will love because there's really not a lot of intensity to it. It doesn't really matter how the cookies look when they're done because they're just gonna get crumbled up. And for the most part, you'll be making this on the stove top. So what I'm doing here is softening up four tablespoons of butter it's a quick little chocolate shortbread recipe. We're gonna add a tablespoon of white sugar and a tablespoon of brown sugar into the mix here. Continue rubbing that together until I have one nice little buttery, sugary mixture. Such a small batch of cookies that it's almost difficult to mix it. So work with a wide bowl and a nice wide sturdy spoon or spatula and you will have success. Now, once you've got that butter and sugar all blended together about like that, go ahead and dump in a quarter cup of cocoa powder and a quarter cup of flour. I'm actually using Dutch processed cocoa powder for this because I like the flavor of it in a shortbread cookie. Continue just kind of rubbing it together like I said, this is a small batch, and that makes it a little bit more difficult because it's just too small for a mixer. So just keep working on it. Well, that's looking good and combined right there. One of the great things about a shortbread cookie is that it's almost impossible to mess up. So once you have it looking like a very stiff frosting, gather it all together and plop it in a small baking dish. Don't get too fussy about this. Anything that is oven proof and um, good for baking in will work fantastically well for a shortbread cookie. But you do wanna make sure that you scrape out the bowl the shortbread cookie will have a very stiff dough and it's gonna wanna stick to the edges. And believe me, you're gonna want it all in your recipe because it's so darn tasty. 
and I have a little pinch bowl of flour here handy. And that is so that I can coat my fingers and kind of press the cookie into the baking dish that I have chosen. And you can see here that I've chosen a nice, simple, humble little casserole dish. Anytime the fingers start sticking to the dough, just grab a little more flour and kind of press it out to be a oh, quarter inch thick or so. And the beauty of this is it doesn't really matter how it looks as long as it's a fairly even thickness. Now another helpful little baking tip for shortbread cookies and pastry in general is to dock it or poke it several times. And that's just so it can kind of ventilate and breathe as it bakes. Now it's time to put this in the oven. Got my oven set to 350 degrees. I'm baking it in the top third of the oven. And it's gonna need to bake for 15, 20 minutes or until it's all set all the way through. Hi everyone, it's Wendy and I just wanted to tell you about my e-cookbook, Date Night at Home Recipes for Two. There's over 80 original recipes with nice detailed instructions and plenty of tips and hints. It sells for $7.99. Go to our website, hotkitchenonline.com and follow the links. It's available for your computer or your Kindle. Okay, there we go. We have everything. We are mise en place to make the custard for the panna cotta. So the first thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is take your teaspoon of gelatin and sprinkle it over some cold water to soften it up. Now gelatin, of course, has excellent stabilizing properties and is a natural choice to use to thicken up a nice little custard like this panna cotta. You wanna let it sit in that water for at least five minutes or until you're ready to use it. Now let's move on to the panna cotta. We have one cup of whole milk three tablespoons of butter. That's gonna be nice and yummy. Three tablespoons of sugar and about a quarter teaspoon of extract. I've actually chosen to use brandy because it's absolutely divine in this recipe. You just wanna kind of whisk the sugar into the milk as it comes up to temperature over medium low heat. Your objective is to just bring the milk up to a bubble. Now, I was just calling the panna cotta a custard. That is incorrect. In all technicality, it is a pudding. Custard implies that there's eggs in there. Pudding implies that it is thickened cream or milk, and that's what this is. Now, we'll talk about that more in a moment, but right now, we need to get the cookie out. That is one happy little chocolate shortbread cookie there. Look at all that happy bubbliness. You can see that it's set up around the middle, very similar to how it's set up around the edges. That's perfect. Leave it alone, let it cool. So my milk has just come to a boil. In old recipes, you'll hear this step referred to as scalding, and that was something that was necessary back then to sort of pasteurize the milk and make it safe for consumption. These days, in a modern recipe where the milk is already pasteurized and safe to drink, you want to bring it up to this temperature more for flavor and for cooking properties. It starts to sweeten up a little bit when it gets really hot. And also, you need it to boil so that you can activate this gelatin. The gelatin is the thickening star of this nice little pudding. So whisk it all in there, dissolve it in the milk and the melted butter. Now, if you like, you can substitute half milk, half cream for the butter, if you prefer. But I do like the saltiness that the butter adds. And if you happen to be using a milk that's less than, say, whole milk, like 2% or non-fat, go ahead and add a couple extra pats of butter in there to sort of simulate the fat content of cream. You want this dessert to be delicious, rich, and decadent with every bite. So let's say you happen to be serving this dessert to a vegetarian. Okay, omit the gelatin because that's usually not a vegetarian friendly product and substitute in cornstarch. I haven't tested it, but my cook senses say about two tablespoons of cornstarch would get the job done fabulously. So once you see that all the gelatin is dissolved, it's time to pour it into molds. Now I have this fun little mini loaf pan here that I'm gonna be using for a mold. This is dessert for two, so I'm gonna work 
on these outside edges here. And go ahead and fill up two, about two thirds, three quarters full, somewhere in there. And I'm going to reserve the rest of the panna cotta over very low heat for later. In the meantime, this needs to go into the fridge to cool down. Now you're going to want to keep an eye on these because they're going to cool at different rates according to how your fridge and your pan and whatever size mold you decide to go with. I'm going to check on those in about 20 minutes and I'm looking for them to be semi-set before I add in the chocolate cookies. And we are moving on to the scalloped potatoes with fennel bechamel and this here is a nice little bulb of fennel. Fennel is a lovely root vegetable that is it's somewhere in texture and construction between an onion and a, and a celery stalk. It's a very interesting root vegetable. It has really nice flavors to it. You want to start by trimming off the bottom. And of course, there's typically lots of greens coming off the top. Just go ahead and cut all that off too. You're going to need about half a bulb's worth of fennel, kind of sliced up like that. You don't have to get too particular about it. Just give it a nice little dice. That will do the trick right there. And then add the fennel to the butter that you start for the bechamel sauce. There's a tablespoon of butter. Now I'm adding in the fennel. It's, it's very fibrous and very tough. And you want to give it a chance to cook in advance of whatever else you're cooking it with because it does take a while. But you cook it low and slow and it develops this lovely anise rooty flavor that is just so distinctive and delicious. I'm going to give it a few minutes here in the butter to kind of know itself and let the butter and fennel become really good friends here in the pot. When you start to smell it becoming very aromatic, add a couple more ingredients into it, more friends into the pot if you will. Add in a tablespoon of flour and a little bit of fresh cracked pepper. It's always good to expose spices to direct heat. Stir all this good stuff together and cook it for about five to ten minutes over medium low heat until you really start to see that fennel soften up. Hi there little fennel. You're looking all nice. You can see that it has softened up a little bit. It's just barely starting to turn translucent and the flour has turned a bit golden. That's fine. Not preferable, but totally acceptable. So let's go ahead and add in a couple tablespoons of chopped up onions, and a teaspoon of salt. Get that all good and happy in there. And then you want to remove the pan from the heat for a few moments. Just let it cool down a little bit because the next thing to add is milk and you want to add milk to a slightly cooler pan than scalding hot so that it is heated gently. So when you hear the sizzle ease down like that a little bit that means it's cooled enough to add the milk. You're going to need a cup of milk. Again I always recommend cooking with whole milk but if you're cooking with something a little bit lower that, than whole milk just go ahead and up your butter factor a little bit so that the sauce tastes right and it has that rich creamy mouthfeel that you know and love in a scalloped potato dish. So stir that all together, get the flour suspended in there, crank up the heat to medium, and bring it up to a bubble. You can see all those yummy little fennel and onion bites just floating around in there. They're going to infuse the flavor deep into the sauce. It's going to be absolutely exquisite. Each little bite of these scalloped potatoes is going to have a nice little pop of the yummy, roasted, sweet, slightly anise flavor of the fennel. It's quite an exquisite way to step up an ordinary dish like scalloped potatoes. And there we go. That's turning into a nice happy little bechamel sauce. That is just absolutely lovely. So now that it's come up to a boil, I just want to cover it with a lid and let it simmer for a few moments and allow the flavor of the flour to kind of cook out and let everything come together in there. In the meantime, I'm going to come over here 
and start slaying out my potato slices. I have two medium-sized potatoes that I sliced into quarter-inch bias slices. And I'm just going to layer them around this nice little casserole pan here. Now when you're working with a small casserole pan, it can be a bit of a logistical challenge. Just kind of work it in there. The beautiful thing about this particular dish is it's all going to get covered in sauce and cheese and breadcrumbs. So it really doesn't matter how you lay that out. And now for the final steps here. Just take the bechamel sauce and pour it over the potatoes. Pour it all over the potatoes. Drown them, drench them in the loveliness that you've made. You see how simple scalloped potatoes are? It's just like the easiest of mother's sauces. Add a little extra love in there. In this case, it's fennel. And then top as desired. I have about two tablespoons each of unflavored breadcrumbs and finely shredded Romano cheese. I'm just gonna kind of mill those together for a moment. And then sprinkle them over the potatoes. And then it's off to the oven with this bad boy. Now let this guy cook for at least 45 minutes, probably closer to an hour at 350 degrees. It's going to take a while for those potatoes to soften up and you want to develop a nice little brown color on top of the gratin. So back here to my panna cotta, the little bit that I had left, just want to draw your attention to the fact that you want to keep it slightly warm so it stays nice and liquidy like that while its cousins in the fridge set up. And now for the vegetable component. So I have half an acorn squash here. I have, of course, scooped the seeds out and I've quartered it to make nice little wells to fill. And we're gonna fill it with a really, really yummy combination. I have one strip of diced up bacon, a couple tablespoons of chopped up nuts. In this instance, I'm using walnuts. Any sort of nut will work perfect for this and a clove or two of garlic, minced up nice and fine. Just mix these together, get them all evenly distributed. There we go. And then dress the squash well with a nice amount of salt and pepper. You really have to shake the salt shaker hard to get enough out of here. There we go. A little bit of pepper. And if you like a little spice in your food, a couple drops of Tabasco sauce on each one is very nice. Tabasco adds a really lovely, bright, spicy flavor. Try to get it down the sides a little bit too. There we go. And then just spoon your lovely little filling mixture onto each one, dividing it approximately evenly between each little well. This is very nice. The nuts add a nice texture to the squash. The bacon adds a nice saltiness and garlic. Well, you know, garlic just makes everything better. Now, if you want to chef this recipe up a little bit, you could use a really high quality cured bacon like uh, pancetta, for example, or prosciutto would be very good too. And you get all sorts of fancy with the nuts. Pecans, of course, are the ultimate nut to cook with. But I like walnuts too because they're a bit more affordable. So place them in a shallow water bath because squash just cooks wonderfully well when it's in just a little bit of water. Cover it tightly with foil to keep that steam inside the baking dish. And then place it in the oven next to the scalloped potatoes. And they should finish up at about the same time. This is totally a set it and forget it kind of meal. So now it's time to finish off the panna cotta. If you poke at them, you can see that they've totally set up and that's perfect. The next thing to do is just kind of break up this cookie into nice chunks. Again, this is a cook's dessert, if there ever was one. Really doesn't matter how it looks, just get the job done. It's gonna look amazing once it's all finished. Yummy little bites of 
delicious chocolate shortbread. Mm -hmm. and just take a nice amount of those, sprinkle them into each well or whatever mold you're using. So ideas for molds would be, like I said, a muffin tin, small bowls, tart pans, all sorts of things. Whatever you want the shape to be, go ahead and use. And then drizzle a little bit of your still liquefied panna cotta pudding over the cookies, kind of set them in place. Don't get too carried away though over with one before you go over to the other. The whole purpose of this is just to lock those cookies into the dessert so that it comes out, for the most part, in one nice clean shot. Make sure you scrape out your pan as best you can. Give it a little jiggle, put it back in the fridge. And I'll show you how to unplate these later, or unmold them later. Oh, what a shame. You may have some extra cookies left over. Guess you're just gonna have to eat them. With the panna cotta done and everything in the oven all happy, it's time to focus attention on the scallop butter. Now, this is not a complex dish by any means, but you do wanna take special care to let the scallops drain out. So I've got them defrosting in a nice little strainer basket. I'm gonna go ahead and add them to a nice hot saute pan. A little bit of olive oil, a little bit of garlic. And this is the point where you want to add in any wet ingredients like the squeeze of lemon. Your objective with this stage is just to cook the scallops, infuse them with the flavor of the garlic, a little bit of basil, and the lemon. This part's pretty straightforward. The scallops of this size should take two to three minutes to cook. Just keep tossing them. What you don't want to do is overcook them. So watch them carefully and you'll see them change from this kind of translucent tone to a very opaque one. And start to see some of the opaque tones building on the outside. See how we're doing here. Now I'm gonna use the old poke test. You can feel how firm the small ones are versus the larger ones that are still a little bit soft. That means we're just about there. You don't wanna overcook them because that'll dry them out. You don't wanna undercook them because that's not safe. I'm gonna go ahead and scoop out some of these little guys here. Get the bigger ones a chance to finish. All right, I'm satisfied with that. So now I'm just gonna pour them back into my strainer basket here and let all that liquid drain off. I'm gonna get the garlic in there though. So just let these cool down for a couple minutes till you can handle them. And then we'll go on to the next step. Yeah, this is definitely cool enough to handle now. So now, take your scallops, throw them out on a cutting board, get that garlic in there too, those herbs in there. And maintain your straining basket set up. And then just kind of chop these up coarsely. It's a really wonderful way to stretch a couple dollars in scallops. You want to chop them up so that each little bite of steak also comes with a yummy bite of scallop. There we go. You don't want to puree the schnot out of them or anything, but you do want to get them nice and chopped up just like that and then put them back on your strainer basket because as they cool, they're going to release more liquid and you don't necessarily want that liquid in the butter. And you can just let these hang out on the counter because it's only like 20, 25 minutes until dinner. 
Now in preparation for the final big event, I'm gonna go ahead and get my grill preheating. All right, it's the big moment. Time to throw the steaks on the grill. I always like to give them one last flip before I send them off. I'm gonna place this nice big one right here in the very hottest part of my grill. <laughs> and this cute little one, a little bit cooler point. Put them presentation side down first. And make sure you save your marinade. Now while we wait for those to get going, let's get stuff out of the oven. Oh, ho, 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 that's a nice. That's a very nice right there. Look at those beautiful scalloped potatoes. Oh, let's take a little look here at the squash. Yum. I'm just gonna keep the foil lid on that so they retain their heat. Not worried about the potatoes retaining their heat because potatoes do that just fine on their own. I'm gonna grill these for about oh three to four minutes per side because I like these steaks to be about medium rare. Well, that's generally how I prefer every steak. That's extra convenient when dealing with a tri-tip because if it's overcooked, it can get a little tough. So that's one reason why we marinated them. The other one was for flavor. And now with the steaks going, turn our attention to the scallop butter. So in this step, what you're looking for is to just achieve a melting of the butter. Break it up while it's in the pan. If you're using a non-stick pan like I am, make sure you use a nice soft tool like a soft spatula. And basically what you just wanna do is just barely get it to a liquefied point. You don't want it to boil, you don't want any of that business. You can even still have some slightly solid chunks of butter still in there like that that's great right there now you want to take it off the heat and fold in those cooked scallops and just fold all that goodness together and let it sit away from any sources of heat and kind of come back together as butter And that, my friends, is gonna be a lovely, tasty, buttery, yummy little topper to the steaks. Speaking of the steaks, I do believe it is about time to flip. So I'm just gonna hit them with a little bit more of my marinade. Keep them nice and moist and happy. We all want happy steaks in our life, right? Nice little flip. Mmm, mmm. And then a little more happiness poured over the top. Oh, yeah. Let's check on these steaks. I'm poking at them and I can feel they've firmed up quite a bit, but not all the way. It means they should be about medium, medium rare. So I'm gonna go ahead and take them off the grill. And you wanna let them sit here for about five minutes or so, and let the juices drop back into the meat before you go slicing into them. In the meantime, let's plate. Oh, you can smell the bacon nuts working together on the squash. That's very nice. It's making me realize I'm very hungry. You're gonna love the way the bacon kind of self-bastes the squash. Nice little scoop of this love. Now let's slice up some steak. Mmm, so juicy and delicious. Now 
don't tell anybody, but I'm going to steal a few slices of this big one right here and supplement the little one. scallop butter. Hmm. Yummy. Fresh basil for effect. And look at that, you little rock star chef, you. For under 20 bucks, you just whipped up a five-star dinner for your date night at home. That's awesome stuff. Now pair this up with a nice assertive red wine, I think Zinfandel or Merlot, and call in your sweetie. Yoo-hoo, lover boy, dinner time. Hi. Hi. Look at this. Ooh, does that look good? Ooh, who's <laughs> My dear? Thanks. Oh, oh yum. Huh. Another awesome date night creation just for you. Delicious. Mm -hmm. This is such a hot kitchen. <laughs> Thanks for joining me in my hot kitchen tonight. Now remember, I still have to show you how to get the panna cotta out of its molds, which you have to do right before you serve it. So stay tuned after the credits for how to do that. So to unmold the panna cotta, you're going to need something nice and slim, like this cute little slender spatula. You can also use a butter knife for this. Run it along the outside. Loosen it up from the edges. This is going to be yummy. And now it's time for the dramatic flip. plates on top of the mold and flip it all over in one shot. Garnish with some chocolate shavings. And then take a yummy bite. Oh, hi. You want a bite of that? Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. Night, night. Pet the kitties.